Max here. I've got some fun stuff going on with my Porcelione de Spinosis and wanted to kind of share that with you. So we're going to start out looking at this party mix because this is part of the story. Let's see who's in the chat today. We've got Frank the Tank, Sean Meister, Mike Fernandez, and those are the four that I see so far. Oh, the Kingdom of Animals is here as well. Just going to put a piece of river shrimp in there and see what they think about it. Oh, that didn't take long, did it? Jumped right on it. Reptilia Exotics, welcome. Let's see if I can get a nice focus on there. Um, excellent. So, yeah, the Lucky Lotto. Exactly. And I see that Marie, Andrew, and Wendy... And Ryan have all just joined in. Excellent. Welcome. I'm going to open up Patreon over here so I can answer some Patreon questions. Where is it? There it is, right there. Let's see. I see uh, Little City Reptiles, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. Hello. Chad Mostbergen. Cassie Sattler. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. I just fed a piece of dried river shrimp. This is a... Uh, let me see what brand I'm using here. This is... Oh, I kind of ripped off the... Oh, Zilla. Zilla river shrimp. Reptile munchies river shrimp. This is the label. Reptile munchies river shrimp. Comes in this, this pouch. And they are pretty good uh, supplemental food for ice pods. They really love it. And it's good that it has a uh, chitin in it already and everything. Good source of calcium, that kind of stuff. Um, Reptilia Exotics just got dairy cows. That's awesome. Fun morph of Porcelio Lelis. Actually got a video coming out on that species pretty soon. Hopefully going to be filming it tonight. Exactly, Mike. Crustaceans for the crustaceans. So they get a lot of the same uh, resources. Is the volume down a bit? Let me let me play with that a little bit, uh, Wally. I was actually going to ask everybody. I'm going to unplug this over here and replug the on. Just a second. Let me make sure everything's plugged in the way it should be. This is a new microphone, so um, I'm just playing with it. I do have the microphone a little bit further away from my face than I normally do. But remember how my microphone broke last week? Those of you who were in the <laughs> live stream last week broke during the live stream. So how's that? Is that any better? I just reconnected or reach checked the connections on the microphone and moved the microphone just slightly closer to my face. And let's see. Let me know how that goes. All right. Okay, I'm getting some feedback. Reptilia Exotics. Lucas, so it's sounding better, huh? Awesome. So. Um, so the volume is still low for some of you and not for others? Interesting. Let me try clipping it somewhere else, okay? I'm just going to play around with that a little bit. Okay, I just moved the uh, microphone a little bit more. And how is that? How is that? How are we doing? I'll just make sure I speak nice and loudly, and if you need to turn your volume down, then I will, uh, then we won't worry about it. Okay, it is getting better now. All right, good. Glad to hear it. I will, I will go with this. How's the video coming in? Is it fuzzy? I'm trying to avoid fuzziness. Wanted to zoom in a little bit and see how that does. That's kind of fun. Oh, look at the top left quadrant. Um... Mm, well, it's not the top left quadrant anymore. I'm getting some interesting things out of this culture, okay? And I wanted to share that with you. Um, the purpose, originally, of creating this colony, to give you, a, give you a little background, okay? So, some people are saying the video is coming in blurry, and some people say it's coming in... Well, if it's blurry, then... It's probably your bandwidth or something like that, like on your end, because uh, this 
If it's coming in good for some people, that means it can't be on my end. And yes, this is that is a snake skin. Our corn snake shed his skin not long ago, and you're seeing some belly scales that are left over because they always take forever to eat the belly scales. Um, so yeah, that's what I was trying to get to is buffering. Okay, so the purpose here um, of setting up this party mix originally, I just put Oreo crumbles and oranges in because I wanted to create some orange crumbles or orange creams. They have a couple of different names, but it's basically the Oreo crumbles morph crossed with the orange morph to get um, an orange crumble. Okay, and take a look right there at this specimen. Isn't that interesting? This one looks like it has an ombre effect, where it's kind of light in the front and orange in the back. And I'm not sure what's going on there genetically. If that's just an orange crumble that happened to come out funny or whatever, but I'm getting a few of those, which is interesting. Um, and this is what I'm getting now. Okay, I did end up adding some whiteouts later on because I wanted to make it a true party mix. This is what I'm getting. And these are what I've been pulling from the culture lately. I put them in here temporarily. I'm going to put them in their own bin, probably during this video. You can see I've got orange crumbles. But this, of course, is not the first generation of the cross. The first generation of the cross, all I got was uh, the blues, wild types, double het for orange and for crumbles. And then this is the generation after that. And that's what's starting to show up now. So I see that Vicabulus is in the house. Excellent. MZ just got Armadillidium maculatum. Oh, that's awesome. A great species to start with and a great species to keep forever. Love that species. Um, so Mr. and Mr. Morley would love a culture of orange crumbles. Yeah, they're a little bit hard to find these days, but uh, I'm, I'm working on it like we were talking about and a, maybe a month or two ago I did a video where we saw a couple of these and now I've started isolating them out. So it won't be long before these are producing and for sale. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. You see the one up at the top of the screen? It's kind of a wider body, a larger one. It's sort of got an ombre effect. I'm not sure if that is the same gene, so I'm going to have to watch that. But most of these are coming out just like crumbles, just like Oreo crumbles except for orange. There's a really high expression orange one there, right in the middle of the screen, the smallest one. Now that I'm getting my white balances off, great, that's fun. But you can see how much orange it's got. And it's it's pretty exciting that this is happening. So Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, I'd love to uh, get to the point where I can get you a, a colony of orange crumbles and I, I, wanna, I wanna do that as soon as I can. Oh, oh, I see what you mean, Mike Fudnadis, the hitchhiker, yeah. So Little City Reptiles, yeah, you should try it. It's a, it takes a few generations, a couple generations, but it does happen eventually. Some of the babies that these produce probably won't be Oreo crumbles because they've crossed with who knows what in the party mix, but I'll get there. And morphs of the same species, MZ, do seem to act essentially the same. Now, I have couple of other things to show you but the first thing I want to do is release these these Oreo crumbles into their new bin um, I did make a display bin for them it's easier to keep an eye on them I wanted to say that I actually bought Oreo crumbles at one point I mean orange crumbles at one point from Kyle Candelian at Roach Crossing he sent me a nice starter colony and they started reproducing like crazy um, but uh, it was right when the weather started getting warm and we were putting on, we were changing our, you know, swamp cooler and all this stuff. And they were in a container with fairly high ventilation. And with one thing and another, I wasn't informing my daughter uh, well enough how to hydrate the uh, enclosure. So I got to take the blame for that one. And, oh, that's not exactly what I meant to do, dump cocoa fiber all over their heads. But it won't hurt them. And so it got desiccated and I lost that entire colony which was really sad because it was doing really well. Kyle sent me a good group and and they were breeding lots and lots of babies so I probably had a hundred of them in there and then I didn't which was so sad. But um, I should have some soon here and I'll probably get some from Kyle as well. 
Santiago just got Cuba, Cubara species cappuccino babies. That's awesome. You know, when did I start? Great question. I have that on a container somewhere when I started, I think. <laughs> but I, I took off the label when I was switching things around, so I'm not sure when I started exactly. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Morelli, it sounds good. I will keep that in mind so we can get you some. All right. Do I have wild type Porcelia labus? And if so, have you tried to breed them with oranges? If not, have you tried to breed milk back in dairy cows? Okay, Hunter. I don't have wild type Porcelia labus. I do have the, um, what's that morph called? I don't have the wild types. I have Cali mix, which has some, what look like wild types in it, but they're not because they'll throw whites and they'll throw peachy milk backs and stuff like that. Um, they'll throw all kinds of stuff, but some of them look like wild types, but I haven't tried to cross them with oranges. I thought about it for sure. And then breed milk backs and dairy cows. I haven't done that because I think they're so close. Um, there are some milk backs that look essentially like dairy cows and I wouldn't want to get confused. Um, so I haven't done that, but I can see some value in doing that for the just to see if it works, but it would be a little bit inconclusive, is my feeling. It'd be a little hard to tell if you've succeeded or not because their uh, phenotypes are so similar. That would be the main issue there, just trying to distinguish phenotypes. I'm just getting a container here. I'm sorry, the uh, visibility is not great right now because I don't want to lose any of these. This I've got some interesting things going on here. Um, Oh, uh, met your crested gecko. That's a cool idea, Santiago. So iridescent unicorn. I must say I'm really enjoying my dairy cows. I enjoy dairy cows. Oh, I really, really like them. So I'm with you there. Jay's Crazy Obsessions. Nice, nice to see you here again. Wendy, your granulatum and paraca arriving today. Oh, I got to show you something about my paraca that happened. It's kind of cool. Let's see if there's anybody in here. Okay. Now this one here. Let's see if I can get a, this under a magnifying glass and show you what's going on. Okay, this is not an orange crumble. I don't know if I can get it to work. Basically, this one, you can see it has dark eyes, but it also has um, no color anywhere else. And I've got several of these. And I think it was Hodgepodge Pods that said that these are sometimes called crystal clear perinosis. That's the only time I've ever heard of that, though, which is pretty cool. Um, I think there might be some kind of leucism going on, and I was able to isolate four of them, and I saw at least one more in my uh, party mix. So I'm going to try to get that going. I think there was another one on here that just dropped off. Hopefully it didn't fall in the big bin. That's why I'm using the big bin. Make sure nobody fell. Nope, nobody fell. So this is the largest individual that I have. It's definitely adult. Could be... I'm not sure if it's male or female. I haven't checked yet, but it's... Uh, definitely a reproductive age and the other ones are a little smaller but I'm hoping it's leucistic and that it'll breed true it's not just a super low expression uh, Oreo crumbles but I don't think it is because there's no indication of any other color besides the eyes and that's true of the several specimens that I found so it looks like my main colony of party mix is throwing these which is gonna be fun and let me pull up chat while I show you something else. Okay. Um, so any other mutations I've noticed? Um, there's that Ombra one that I've noticed, which is weird, but I haven't noticed any uh, thing in size or fecundity because they're all crazy. Uh, fertile critters. These, this is my smallest Oreo crumbles colony. And I'm starting to see some oranges in here, which is interesting. Like, isn't that an orange right there? Does anybody else see that? Does that look orange to you? It looks orange to me, so let me know. Um, okay, so it looks like some people were helping out the soul of oryx with um, some humidity. Good idea when you got a problem like that. And 
Let's see, 503 Menagerie's here, welcome. So, MZ, the difference between Porcelio Labus and Porcelio Scaber. Should we check it out? Um, well, I can show you that in a minute. But does anybody see any orange Oreo crumbles in here? Just wanted to check that out. So Guadagnin has black, orange, and white. Cool. Okay. Um, part of my deal is that I have some difficulty in uh, color identification to some degree. So I'm trying to see what I've got here. I think most of these are just normal Oreo crumbles, though. And right, uh, Sandy, Scaber is, is rough and Labus is smooth. We should do a comparison, shall we? I think that would be fun. Um, okay, let's do a comparison of Scaber and uh, Labus. Okay, let me just play around here for a second. I've got my microphone on. As I walk across the room here, so hopefully this you can still hear me when I do that. If you can't, then that means my microphone is not working the way it should be, and I need to make some adjustments. So, microphone is engaged. Let's hope it's working. All right, Santiago. Um, well, was that who asked the question, or is it somebody else? I can't remember now. Okay. These are Porcelio Labus um, lava. Okay, I'm Porcelio Labus lava. Sorry, Porcelio Scaber lava. Um, and isopods can definitely eat carrots. Yes, if you look close up on these, let's see if we can get close up. The you can see little bumps on on their bodies. And you can, you can see that, in, especially in this lava one here. You can see those bumps on their bodies. And that's why they're called Porcelia scaber, because they have those bumps. And it's... Uh, hopefully that helps. Let's, let's go with that. And now... Let's look at some Lavis. To get an idea of how smooth they look. They're also wider, they get larger than Porcelia scaber in general, but their body shape is wider and they're definitely glossier and smoother. So let's take a look. This is my uh, Porcelia Labus Cali mix. I like these a lot. You can see they have a lot of different colors. Some of them look like wild types. Some of them look sort of peachy, orangey. Some are white. And they are very smooth and very glossy. And Guada, Guadanine, I can't remember how you say your name, but yes, the bigger ones, there are some bigger ones in there that don't have as much orange, which is interesting. And there's, there's one that has the white back and then an interesting center to the carapace. The lava are super hot. I love them. Lavas are my favorite uh, Porcelia Scaber morph so far. And Emily, welcome. Emmeline, sorry, welcome. Red calico, too. Yeah, those are cool. So imaginary isopods don't descend from trilobites, but they are similar in some ways. They're very, very distantly related to trilobites. Very, very distant. But they are all arthropods. Um, trilobites are not uh, not very closely related to anything that exists now. But there are certainly some visible similarities. There, there are even trilobites that can conglobate. They can roll up into a ball. My son sent me a picture in from his paleontology class of con he was holding a conglobating trilobite fossil, which was so cool. Um, Frank to tank, it might be Trichelopus rathki or rathki that look almost identical to scavers, and you have to count the pleopodal lungs. 
Yeah, these these are getting beetle jelly. This is beetle jelly I take out of my uh, beetle enclosure after a week, rehydrate it, and then uh, to not waste it, I feed it off to isopods or millipedes or somebody, beetles of, you know, like superworm beetles get it, somebody gets it. Um, yep. All right, cool. I hope that helps with the difference there. I, I love these guys. These are a smaller uh, type of labus, but they're still pretty cool. And, oh, Emelyn, I haven't talked about dart frogs and, and morning geckos yet, so I'm going to get there. I actually need to hit some Patreon questions. But look at that one. That's cool, the different tones on that one. It's kind of neat. So I'm going to pull up the uh, questions on Patreon right now, and we'll hit some of those. Okay, well, first question that I'm going to answer is Emily's, so, because I'm thinking about it right now. And that question was about... I'm just pulling it up here. It is about keeping morning geckos and dart frogs together. So Emily was asking, can you really keep morning geckos and dart frogs together? The ladies are doing great. She purchased some from me, some uh, morning geckos, but never go into the bottom four to five inches of the enclosure. I've been looking and it seems pretty controversial, so we'd love to hear about your experience. So I'm gonna move these guys out and we'll start to answer Emily's question. Let me get some other isopods in here so you're not looking at nothing. That's no fun. Um, I wanted to show you, hopefully this is gonna work, we'll see looking for something that I discovered in the Armadillidium paracai enclosure yesterday. So, to Emmeline's question, a lot of people do it. I know someone who is a local dart frog breeder. His name is Ray. Oh, well, that was lucky. Look at that. Look at that, what I found in my paracai culture uh, yesterday. Pretty neat. I had no idea I was going to pop open and see it right there, but that's cool. Um, a lot of people do it. He does it. The reason he does it is because he doesn't want the spiders in his uh, dart frog enclosures. And the uh, morning geckos effectively prey on the spiders. So that's why he does it. Um, and it works for him. And he's done it for a long time and it works really well. So um, I would say, and 503 Menagerie, it appears to be a pied paraca. Yeah. As far as I can tell. They're, they're, that's the only one that has shown up so far, but that's what I'm getting. You can see they're breeding well already. It's not too much of a surprise with this species, but the uh, pied was a surprise. But anyway, back to Emily's questions about the morning geckos. Originally, I was keeping morning geckos only and didn't have any dart frogs. Then I got some dart frogs and put them in with my morning geckos. After keeping them there for several months and having some issues, mostly with the lid and the, the humidity and that kind of stuff, and one really bad problem happened that I modified the lid so it was better for holding humidity and one of the uh, morning geckos ended up getting caught in the lid and dying, which just totally broke my heart. So I stopped doing it and separated them and kept them separated for years. More recently, I've tried again. I have a different kind of lid that doesn't bother the uh, morning geckos or the dart frogs. It's good for both of them. And so I put um, some of them together in there and now I'm keeping some young ones in there. One of my main issues with keeping them together indefinitely is that as once they get to adulthood, they'll start laying eggs up near the top, and they could lay them where opening the lid could damage those eggs. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, that is one of my concerns that I have. Another one is if there's not enough ventilation, dart frogs can get by with very little ventilation. They need some, but not very much. I think morning geckos need a little bit more. So I would say that's one of my issues with it. Um, like I said, I'm going to be moving mine out once they get a little older so that I don't have problems with eggs. Temporarily, I don't think it's a problem. But long term, I think that is one of the issues. I do think it's not necessarily an issue that they do some resource partitioning and sort of um, divide the enclosure because, you know, living creatures are doing that in the wild all the time. and It's not necessarily a, a bad thing. So that's what I would say. I hope that helps. And Lynn, I do think that's a great question. And I'm going to now pull open the question, the other questions on Patreon, and address some of those. So, 
Um, the geologist had some questions. He said, what, is your, what are your thoughts on the constant stain, I think it's supposed to be constant stream, of new morphs that come out? I'm talking about isopods. Um, I was thinking about this yesterday, and it just seems constant. Dairy cow, brown, dairy cow, white, dairy cow, almost brown, but more yellow. You know what I mean? And I do know what you mean. Um, I feel that personally it's becoming a bit too much, and people are jumping on even tiny, tiny differences, trying to get a morph out of it. Feel free to use this as a segment on a live or video. I do like, for example, maculatum, maculatum yellow, and maculatum whiteout. They're good and extremely obvious differences, but with some other morphs of Porcelio and, heck, even Armadillidium Montenegro, it gets a bit silly. I'd love your input. So, I, uh, I totally see what you're saying, totally see where you're coming from, and I would say that there's a couple of things going on here. One, we need to ensure that these differences are obvious enough. You know, if if they're too difficult to distinguish as differences, then I don't see much of a point. Another thing, we need to make sure that they're breeding too. Oh, those are my pied, those are my pied paraki again, right there, in approximately in the middle of the screen. Let's see if we can get a look at it. How many are there in there? I think that might actually be a different size from the previous one. Wouldn't that be something if I had more than one in here? More than one pied paraki? I don't know if I do. Well, there's there's the one I was talking about before. Yeah, I think the, the other one had a slightly different pattern. I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. But see, this one, it's a pretty obvious difference. I would see, I this is worth isolating. I think I'll probably try to isolate this because I think that's very clear when you have a pied paraki as opposed to a wild type. But if you have a real hard time telling the difference, then I don't see much of a point. Another thing that I think is that if, if a morph reduces the visual impact of the isopod, like if it makes less contrast where there used to be more or something like that, uh, I'm not hugely a big fan. Like I'm not a big fan of Armadillidium klugei pudding because you're removing the red skirts. And the red skirts are fully half of what make them cool. So by getting rid of the red skirts, I don't think it's an improvement. So I used to have some puddings, and I ended up selling them because I thought, selling them all, because I thought, eh, I'm not too excited about it. Um, also, I, have, I feel the same way about the the, uh, pors the dairy cow whites, because I really like the fact that they have these strong expressions of their pattern. And then the dairy cow white is basically removing that and making them more like the um, low expression Dalmatian porcellus caber, which... I'm not a particular fan of. So uh, a nice Dalmatian with good expression looks awesome, but one with hardly any expression is not very exciting. So I think that's one issue too. And also, does it um, the change decrease the fitness or health um, of the isopod? There are some morphs that may do that. There's one gestroy morph that I think increases the green coloration, but also comes with... Uh, uh, kind of a deformation of the sides of the um, pleurites and the um, perionites that makes it harder to molt, something like that. So I'm not a fan of something that does that either. I hope that kind of helps address your question. I know a lot of it has to do with personal preference and, you know, whatever floats your boat, but I think we need to keep in mind, is it replicable? Is it distinguishable? Is it healthy? And does it actually increase the attractiveness of the isopod, at least in the eye of enough beholders to make it worth it? I guess that would be my summary. <laughs> and Wally says, Russ, great point, and I am right with you on uh, armadillidium klugei puddings, unless they lead to something down the line that will really be a knockout. Good point. I have heard that they're getting some purple puddings that are actually quite purple. I haven't seen any of those, but I've heard about them. Um... I'm going to put the paraki back, and somebody was asking about Punta Cana High Contrast. I think it was Sandy was asking about the Punta Cana High Contrast, and let's take a look and see what we can see in this bin. There are um, lots of babies in here. Ton there's, there's a fairly large one right there. Um, let's see what we can find. There's there's a large adult right there. There's some babies with various 
colors. Of course, baby Armadillidium vulgata, you never know what you're going to get. They always change. But um, there's a nice big adult there. That's a nice looking one. What do we got here? Here are loads of babies. And random tea, besides the one I mentioned with uh, the, what was it? The molting issues with that Jestroy morph. I'm not aware of a whole lot. I've heard there's a Trichelopus rathki Dalmatian that's less fit and healthy than the uh, most, uh, than the, the wild type. But I, I don't know. That's, that's what I've heard. I haven't worked with that morph at all. So there's, there's quite a few babies in here. But, yeah. So, Lunas Reptiles, IG. How do you make lavas? Um, you can't really make the lavas. You either have to... The mutation, the same mutation that occurred to make lavas has to occur, which is fairly uh, poor chance that that would happen. Uh, or, you would have to uh, just get some lavas. And so... Um, Oreo crumbles are actually a totally different species from um, lavas, and uh, Oreo crumbles and koi scabers, yeah, they're two different species. Koi scabers are the same species as lava, and they could interbreed with them, but Oreo crumbles are a totally different species, so they won't interbreed. They'll just, uh, one of them is most likely to outcompete out the other. Aqua Garden Zen, hello. Welcome. Yeah, it's it's kind of nice to to work with a breeder who has experience. I agree. Um, you can get them on eBay. I purchased some on eBay once, but the uh, per the seller was local and brought everything to an expo, so I got to see it before I brought it home, which was nice. That's the only time I bought ice pods from that. And Jestroy is one of my favorites. Oh yeah, reptile, reptilian exotic. So, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, there's the Jestroy for you. Mm. And I should try feeding these guys on camera because they're usually pretty good feeders. Um, even in in light, even when it's out in the light. So let's see what we can do. Maybe they'll eat some pollen. They're usually, I don't, I don't remember if I've ever tried feeding them pollen on camera. Well, cork bark is a necessity too, and maybe you can pick some of these up the next time around. And Lunas, yeah, please, please do contact me. My shipping is uh, closing down. Next week is my last ship date for, I think, is it next week? I think it is. Tuesday 16th is my last ship date of the year, and I won't be shipping until late January again. So I have some questions from Sandy right here on Patreon. It says, hey Russ, I was just considering the Hoffman's Egg Eye Ice Pod. Do you agree that they are more nurturing to their offspring? Have you seen this, or does anyone have actual footage or evidence? Um, I, I don't think I've, I've seen young Hoffman's egg guy hanging out with adults, hanging out with female adults, but I, I don't have any direct evidence that those are their offspring or not. Um, Oren in his book mentions specifically that they will, um, hang out with their parents for many days, but, uh, specifically with reference to Hoffman's egg guy. I have seen other large porcelio hang out with their babies for days. I've seen Porcelli or Nottis do that, and that's pretty cool. Uh, I've seen it, and I've actually filmed that. I've seen Porcelli or Flava Marginatus hanging out with their babies and filmed it, but uh, I don't think I've done that with Hoffman's egg eye. Is anybody else? And then also in all isopods, do monkeys survive as separated from mother from each other? They can. It just depends. If they were ready to be born, generally they can do fine without... 
uh, parental care in most cases. Um, but sometimes what will happen is you, someone will pick up an isopod and the marsupium, which is constructed of these plates called oostegites on the mother, it, it's kind of brittle actually. When you pick up an isopod that is heavily with uh, babies, its marsupium is full and babies are about to be leave that pouch, they can easily the, rupture and you can lose, and even before that, even when the eggs are just eggs, can easily rupture and you can lose the eggs, That the eggs will die. The babies, depending on how developed they are, can die. So if it's, you know, too early, they could easily die. But if, if it's time for them to be born and they're born and their mother is not around to take care of them, they can actually survive just fine in most cases that I'm aware of. Um, I can think of a case where that may not be true, and that's uh, Hemilopistes reamuri, the, one of the desert-adapted isopods. The mother and father actually both provide cooperative care for the babies, and they rely on the microclimate of the burrow in the desert to survive, and they rely on the parents bringing them food. So in that case, without parental care, they might well die. But I think in most cases, as long as they're developed enough, they could do it. Uh, let's see. There was. I haven't seen evidence of magnificence either. That doesn't. Me. I just haven't seen it. Um, my my magnificence have bred for me. I've had a couple of different generations of magnificence, but I haven't seen any parental care in them. Uh, Emily, smell the, the live stream. Yeah, the forest floor smell is really nice. I like it too. Oh, so Frank de Tank has some input there in the Hoffman's egg eye. She died not long after the brood, but the younglings are fine. So there you go. Richard, Richard Font says, can you breed any color of same species together as a project like Porcellus caber or with native Porcellus caber? Or would they just set them back to the normal gray? Well, generally, this is a great question. Generally, what you'd get... In that case, it depends on the trait, and a trait like Porcella lava trait does seem to be co-dominant, so this wouldn't necessarily happen with that. But with most traits, they seem to be single gene recessive or, or a combination of single gene recessive traits, uh, depending on what the trait is. So orange Dalmatian is a combination of orange and Dalmatian trait, at least the ones I produced, produced that way. Um, but something like orange koi is a single gene recessive trait for koi plus a single gene recessive trait for orange. So you have two single gene recessive traits, and if you cross them with native Porcellio scaber, what you do, you get a generation of all wild types, probably. That's the most common thing that would happen. And then if you crossed those, that second generation with each other, you would get um, some babies that would be just koi, some babies that would be just orange, and some babies that would be orange koi. Approximately 16%, I think it is. Last time I did the math, if I remember correctly. Approximately 16% of them would be um, orange koi in that second generation of the crosses of that. So it's not the first generation cross, but the second generation cross, you would get some orange koi. And then you'd get, a, like I said, some oranges and some koi's and some normals, some wild types. And then uh, Roger said, I've tried to make orange cream, talking about the Porcellionides prunosis. Um, says, I've tried to make orange cream and have had bizarre results. The oranges have multiplied faster. The Oreos seem to be diminishing and or replaced by regular powder blues. So what could be happening there is you got the Oreo and the orange cream, they cross all the babies should look like powder blues. Wild types. Um, Every single one of the babies should look like that um, if we're dealing with single gene uh, recessive uh, traits. Then you have a few that are tricolored being white, orange, powder blue, and black. Now that's awesome. And um, I'm not sure how that happened because that is not following what I would expect with what we know of the genetics. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying it's surprising. So that's cool. And I would love to see some of those. If you can send me some pictures or video clips or direct me to your video or something, I'd love to see that. And finding oranges in four of your other bins, they teleport. And by, by that, I just mean that these isopods, um, uh, 
they it's easy for them to get into other bins. They'll climb up the sides of a bin. You know, if it's a little bit dirty or a little bit wet, they'll climb right up the sides and squeeze through and get into other bins. And they, they're fairly resistant to dryness. So that means they get out and they're not going to desiccate right away. It's going to take them a while to desiccate. And so they have time to get into another bin. It happens. And that is why I have all of my uh, powder oranges, whatever morph, are... Uh, you know, quite a few feet away from my main collection of isopods so that I don't have to worry about it. Oh, I see we got a super chat. Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, you're a great supporter of the channel. I really appreciate it. So it says, just some support for your channel. Thanks for what you do and for sharing your knowledge and experience in the hobby. I appreciate that a lot. Um, this, uh, the super chats really go a long way. So that is, that is helpful and appreciated very much. So, let's see. So I guess I kind of finished it, finished that question about the uh, orange cream from Roger. And Roger, do let me know. I'd love to find out more about the uh, the tricolors you got going. Um, and Roger has another says almost any uh, also any recommendations on food for toads and gray tree frogs? I've been feeding Heidi a fruit flies, and the toads get mealworms occasionally. The tree frogs almost never come down to the bottom, so mealworms, etc., would be wasted on them. Um, breeding crickets doesn't seem as easy, but starting to think the fruit flies aren't enough food. And they may not be, depending on your size of the species you're working with. I haven't worked with gray tree frogs, and I'm not sure what species of toad you're working with. But um, as far as the tree frogs go, crickets can be a good uh, option. People don't necessarily like to deal with them. I've been breeding crickets for years. Not my favorite insect to work with, to be honest. Um, you can look into some other things. You could look into getting some uh, black soldier fly larvae. And as far as getting the mealworms, one thing you could look at is using a um, feeding dish, a magnetic feeding ledge, and putting them in a dish. Um, and if you put them in a, in a dish in this magnetic feeding ledge up high where they're going to see it, you may get them to eat some of the more terrestrial creatures like uh, mealworms on occasion. Um, if you're not opposed to breeding roaches, that could be something you could look at. Um, I can't because my wife has asked me not to, and I respect her wish on that point. But uh, I would say, yeah. Um, crickets are definitely going to be a food that both of them will probably appreciate. Roaches could be a thing. Um, the black soldier fly larvae, also known as phoenix worms, and they have several other named calcium worms and stuff that you can buy at the pet store. Uh, could help round out the diet a little bit more too. And, oh, I like what you're saying, Wally, there. Yeah, I did a video quite a while ago and said that if you don't remove the stems from the leaves or at least keep the stems from, you know, making a little bridge, and I've mentioned it in more than one video, if, if you were making a bridge with any of your substrate or your leaves or whatever, they're going to climb out. MZ, I have kept isopods in very dark conditions. I don't know that I've ever used them in an, an opaque bin, but you could probably do that. Um, I have kept them in closed cupboards, and they're fine. And I use a lot of display cases for a lot of my isopods. I have a display case of these now very sedentary um, armadillidium gestroy on my desk at work and they I, when I feed them they all come out and I eat and they're perfectly happy to do so it's pretty cool to watch um, I have a lot of bins like that my let's go back to our party mix for a minute and just see that bin okay this is a clear acrylic bin and I keep them in here so I keep a number of isopods. I just moved my uh, Flavo Marginatus into a big clear bin too. So yeah, you can do it. Um, and where I named the mealworm ledge, that is a good point. I mean, it's worth a try. I'm not entirely, I can't promise they'll notice it, but I think they will. And we have a cat that'll kill the runaway crickets too. And Aqua Garden Zen. Yeah, Dubia roaches seem to be a good go-to if you're going to do roaches. Kevin Zay has a super chat here saying, uh, are there certain species of dark frog that are more suited to someone who has never owned that species before? 
Um, I would say that bumblebee dart frogs are a great one to go with for beginners. They tend to be a little bit more forgiving in terms of temperature range. Still, you have to be pretty careful, but not quite as careful as some of the others. Um, they tend to be a little more, less aggressive to their own species. Uh, and they are just a pretty good one to start with. That's what I started with. I also got an auratus at the time. Um, the auratus unfortunately got out when I was removing some decor and redecorating, and I didn't notice until it had dried out, which was sad. But they're also pretty bold, so they're a great species to work with. Not particularly difficult to breed. I really like them. I would suggest the Dendrobates leucomelas, the uh, bumblebee dart frog. And Frank de Tank, anyone who wants a large colony of the ice pods hunting feeder insects? I have given them crickets, uh, not just straight alive crickets, like crush the head of the crickets and give them those. And I've done the same thing with pest moths and stuff. And they go after those, I'll tell you that. Immediately. Um, I've given them dried mealworms, not live ones, I don't think. And Emlyn, yes, these, these bins, I get these at the Hobby Lobby and drill them. You can see I've got holes drilled along the sides. I drill a few holes in the top and both sides, and they, they are great. I like them a lot. They're not even that expensive. Um, and this, somebody's asking, it was Emlyn asking, this is a snake shed, the remains of a snake shed. They ate most of it, but uh, these are the belly scales. They usually leave the belly scales for a while. They, I don't know why, they may be a little tougher or something, but they, they seem to, to do that. The Pocosaurus, hello! Oh, thank you, Wally. Someone asked if I had experience with pill millipedes. Zero! I have experience with millipedes of various types, but not pill millipedes at all. None. Um, I would like to try some at some point, but I don't have permits for any of the Glomera species, and the larger species don't seem to be very uh, sustainable in captivity. They don't seem to do well. Uh, so, yeah. I, they generally seem to die for people. They say some people may have cracked the code, but I'm not aware of that. But anyway, you can't get them shipped into the U.S., as far as I know. So... And yes, Wally, is that the one that uh, Johannes did uh, not long ago with, uh, I can't remember her name, but she was in Alabama. That was a great one. I watched that myself and enjoyed it. Um, I wasn't able to catch it live, but if that's the one you're talking about, whether it is or not, please share. But I'm expecting that that's the one that you uh, are talking about, and I hope you do share it. Stephanie, that's the name. Yep, that was great. Enjoyed that. Uh, so, Kevin, yes, you would need an awful lot of isopods, but seriously, um, because there's there's a lot of surface area to snake skin, but not a ton of volume, with a boa, you'd still need a lot, but you throw that in a large dairy cow colony, and I bet they'd take a chunk out of it pretty fast. So, yeah, if you're at all interested in pill millipedes, please check this out. This lady's, uh, Stephanie, is, uh having some good success breeding some of the glomerous species of pill millipedes that are in the hobby here in the U.S. Now, uh, European species that are in the hobby here in the U.S., so it's a great, uh, great listen. So how big is your boa, Kevin? I think I've seen a couple pictures of your boa. It seems like it. And closer fork, they just found a baby Punta Cana. Excellent. That is that's excellent. Congratulations on that. And if there's one in there, there's bound to be more because generally Punta Cana's, when they have babies, they have a good number of them. So hopefully you'll, you'll see quite a few more in there soon. That's awesome. So eight to nine feet. So definitely a lot bigger than a ball python shed. Uh, you're not going to get any ball pythons that big, but... Um, oh, you might, you might even be getting bigger. That's awesome. Okay. I haven't even looked at the clock until now. I have about 10 minutes left. 
does anybody have let me see if I have any other patreon questions that I haven't covered and then uh, let's see Roger Richard Sandy um, geologist I hope I covered everything sometimes I think you know people post in different spots where they put it in the messages instead of the uh, posted on the on the post as a comment so I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything but I think I caught everything so if you have any other questions Darius love munching on my blue tongue skink shit I bet and NX Lee not sure how to say your name but uh, do you cycle your ice pod tank before adding new species and how long do you go about doing it for or when you know if it's cycled um, I would say in an ideal world that's a super important thing to do and I uh, try to do that um, what I try to do is set up a bin in advance and I'm gonna grab let me grab another bin of ice pots because we've been looking at these beauties for a while which is great because I love them seriously these are underrated they're just fun especially you know uh, when you get a lot of variety and a lot of activity out of them like that what I try to do is set them up, set up the bin with springtails for as far ahead of time as I can. And sometimes that's days. Let's see. This is this is my new witch's brew colony. There's a witch's brew right over there. Check it out. There's a couple of witch's brews there. Pretty cool. This is a Porcelia ornatus morph. Um, let's see. Is anybody under here? There's some. See, look how they have the... They're like a magic potion, but they're a Porcelia ornatus version of the... Armadillity and Magic Potion, so they've got yellow on them and dark colors. Pretty cool. They, I don't think they're breeding yet. They're a little young. But um, I try to set it up with springtails ahead of time. Ideally, I'd do it two months ahead of time. And usually it doesn't end up being that long. Sometimes it's just a day or two or whatever. But um, as early as possible I can before I put isopods in it with springtails to cycle it. And once you notice that you know, the springtails are doing really well, and any initial mold blooms have come down, that you kind of know it's cycling. So I hope that helps. So 503 Menagerie, Molly's had babies, cool. So Molly babies um, need a lot of food. If you can get some algae that they can pick at all the time, the kind of algae that they like and have them picking at it all the time, and as well as that, um, eating you know other foods too like baby brine shrimp and that stuff uh i think you'll do well with them uh they don't uh they don't do well when they don't get enough food so if you're hatching live baby brine shrimp and getting them that at least a couple times a day doing some crushed flake food food and then they have algae to nibble on all the time they should do really well and they need more space than uh you might think uh, being mollies i mean it depends on which morph of mollies to some degree as well but um, I would say those are those are some tips for Molly's. So Chad Mastbergen, has anyone had dairy cows that get more orange in them? Something that will happen with dairy cows on occasion, based on their food, they can they can sequester carotenoids, basically you know natural colorants from their foods if you're giving them things like fish food or carrots or whatnot, and that will show up in their. Uh, coloration a little bit but they'll still have the base white coloration and build up some orange in their antennae or their legs or whatever and then they will get here I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some other stuff here they will get uh, that that can happen but that's not a genetic thing going on that's just sequestration of food this is my spotted zebra colony I just thought I'd kind of check in on these guys for a minute see how they're looking um, let's see. That's Moon Over Miami. Hello. See, that the idea of keeping the substrate bin, Guara 9, keeping a substrate bin seeded with springtails and replenish what you take out, that's kind of what I do too, and it's a good idea.
Ribbity Reptiles, best commercial available ice pod substrate that's ready to go right out of the bag. I haven't tried very many commercially available ones. Um, I've tried the Lugarti, which is good. I've tried uh, the Permian Exotics, which is good. I think those are the only commercially available substrates I've tried that I can think of. Um, they are ready to go right out of the bag, uh, both of them. But I have made most of my own substrate. Oh, look, there's a, a striped one in there. That's funny. There's some striped babies. Oh, maybe that's why, because they're breeding in here and um, they're not breeding true yet because these are culls. So that makes sense. Okay, I'm missing something. Um, so, Emlyn, if your fish, are you talking about your antlers? I think I'm missing some things in here in the chat somewhere, but if you're talking about your antlers and she's looking kind of rectangular, could be pretty soon. Okay, yeah, those antlers, um, you're probably gonna get uh, babies really soon. Oh, I wanna show you this too. Okay, right here on the side of the container, I know it's hard to see, that is some slime mold. It's dry slime mold right here. Don't let this build up all the way along the side. This one isn't too bad because underneath it does it's not there. And up above is not there. There's just a little smudge and I'm gonna wipe that off. But if you let it go all the way up the container, the ice pods can use it as a ladder. So don't do that. Don't let that happen. So that like I said, that one's not immediately dangerous, but don't let it get there. Don't let it get to the dangerous. Should we take a look at the yellow zebras in the last few minutes and see how they're doing? The yellow zebras I posted about just a little while ago that I got from um, Pet Peds and Pods. This is a, a new colony. Oh, there's one right there. Isn't that something? Just every time I look in here, I'm like, oh, yellow, look at that. I love it. I'm trying to get a good focus on there. There it is. Really, really pretty. Do I have any others that are showing up? I see another one in the corner there. And Wavering Darkness, what's up? What is up? We're just about to, to close up shop here, but I'm trying to figure out if there's anything else I can show. I mean, there's always stuff I can show. Let's grab the American uh, Magic Potions, because they're breeding now, and it'll be... It'll be kind of fun to check on them, see what we got, see if we can see any little babies anywhere. And there's uh, an adult. Any babies down? Oh, holy cow, look at that! This is the uh, American Land Magic Potion. We got a lot of babies in there. This is a pretty new colony too. So, but that's the thing about Armadillidium bulgari. Once they go, they go. You got babies everywhere. Nice crop of springtails in there as well. Always a good sign. That's what I like to see. So, the American Magic Potions bred a lot faster for me than the uh, Japanese Magic Potions did. Although the Japanese Potions are doing really, really well now. I've got loads of them in there, but that was fast. Because let me see the establishment date on this colony. We got the first ones on August nineteenth uh, from um, Treaters and More, and I got the additional stock added in September, September tenth from uh, Bitty Bugs. And Bitty Bugs, Cassie was in the in the chat earlier. I don't know if she still is in there, but uh, she was. Let's just take a look at the, the the Japanese magic potions really quick before I go. Got loads of magic potions, Japanese magic potions. Uh, they're doing super well as well. Here's some here. You can see they're all over the place. Not quite as yellow because that's that's kind of normal. That's a thing. But there's a lot of them in here, and they they do have yellow markings. They're just not quite as many. So the Japanese magic potions are definitely doing well. 
They just didn't start breeding as fast. Ah, oh, congrats, 503, with the magic potion babies. Awesome. So, Reptilia, your powder orange have a couple babies. I'm not sure if they're dwarf white or not. Well, that's, that can be tricky, but um, by the time they're the size of a dwarf white, you should start seeing some orange in there if they are orange. So if not, I would say get some of those adults out there and start a new colony of your oranges if they are all those babies are looking white because you don't want those in there for sure. That'll just cause you grief later on. There's a bunch in there. They're everywhere. Loads of them. Tons of magic potions. All right. Well, no, that's not the button I meant to push. Okay, there we go. Well, it is time to close up shop. Um, thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the isopod tour we did today. The the new projects I'm working with my um, Porcelione de Sprinosis. Wish me luck with the leucistics and with the orange crumbles. Hopefully, uh, we'll get those going as well as the uh, pied armadillidae and paraca and all the others. So. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully I answered all your questions. Thanks for the super chats. Um, really appreciate those. And uh, y'all have a good one. And uh, be on the lookout for a video this Friday.